Okay, guys, in this lesson, what we're going to do is we are going to talk about notation, standard notation and pitch. I'm going to give you a rundown of some of the things that you're going to encounter when it comes to sight reading music. The first thing that we need to know is that we have this system and it is basically a graph. And this is what standard notation really is. If we think about pitch, pitch is the highness or the lowness of a note. So if you think about somebody whistling or screaming in a high pitched voice, then that's the highest highness of a note and if you think the lowness of it if you think about your sub bass on your car then this is what we're dealing with we've essentially got an x and a y pitch axis here so we've got going up these are the high notes and going down these are the lower notes and then what we end up with is we have time going this way so just like western writing going from left to right this is how we understand the highness or the lowness of the pitch now i'm going to be dealing a lot with guitar specifically and to understand guitar what we need to do is if i just come over here and I'll show you something if you think about it the lowest note that you get on your guitar in standard notation written like this is this one here generally in standard tuning you would get this note here. This would be E. And we've got this funny symbol here. And this funny symbol is called the treble clef. So let's get some of the anatomy of this system down. So this here with the five lines, this is called the staff or also known as a stave. And these lines, if I just go over them again, these are called the ledger lines. So you can see we have the staff, which is composed of ledger lines and what dictates the pitch is going to be the type of clef that we have on here. Now there are quite a few different clefs, but with guitar, we need to be able to use the treble clef throughout all of our playing guitar and using the standard notation system for reading guitar music. But what we have to do is we have to delve into something called the grand staff first. Now the grand staff uses two staff systems. So we've got a system there and we've got a system there. It uses something called the treble clef and the bass clef and if you think about it treble is the high notes bass is the low notes if you have one of those old hi-fis you might have had treble which made it tinny and then if you boosted the bass end or the low then this would be this end here these are fancy letters they're just calligraphic letters and what it means is where this treble clef intersects here on that down line and that cross line there then this note here is going to be a G. And this letter here is actually a G. So if your name was George, you could fancify your name up by using it like that. So you could imagine that that is a G. And the reason it is because it crosshairs on that point there to tell you that that is the note that you are focusing on. Now this clef here, the bass clef, so that's the treble, and this is the bass clef. If we look at this one here, you can see there is a ledger line that exists between these two dots. And these two dots are pinpoints in that this is the line that you focus on because the note that goes on there is going to be an F because this is really just a fancy letter F. So if you were called Fred, then that would be a great way to sign your signature. You, you could think of this as being the G clef and this as being the F clef. So that's one way of looking at it. But what we also need to look at is this thing with the highness or lowness. This axis here, so if we imagine this is the X axis and this is a Y axis, then on this X axis, we've got high notes. And what we do is we put notes on using these dots. And if we put a dot in the space that's lower than that positioned on that staff, then this is a lower pitched note. So these notes that I've put on there are getting lower. So high, low, low same thing applies going the opposite direction if i took the same thing in the bass clef although we're going to ditch this bass clef in a minute you can see that this the pitch is going up so it's going from low pitch to a higher pitch this is going from a higher pitch to a low pitch so this is the directional aspect of this x-axis that we have on reading standard notation generally in piano what we have is a note that sits in the middle this is called middle c on the piano and that bridges these two clefts together this is why it's called the grand staff because it's actually one great big staff but it's separated because it's easier for you to see this would be what you played in your right hand and this would be what you played in your left hand when you play piano not always the case but generally that's the way it's divided up 
So if I plot another one of these grand staffs out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the notes from the musical alphabet. We've not included any sharps or flats. We're not using the chromatics. We're just using the natural notes. If I start down here on the bass clef, well, you may have learned some mnemonics to help you to do this, but I just use the cycle of thirds mnemonic to help me with this. And if I just put this over here, it might help you with this as well. Every good band deserves fans and cash so what we're doing is we're just using this because the staves have two things that we need to take notice of they have lines and they have spaces and when we jump up from line to line to line to line to line we're going round in this cycle of thirds when we go in the spaces we're doing exactly the same thing we're going from space to space to space to space we are going round in this cycle of thirds i'll just demonstrate it here on the lines first so we've got the lines so i start here with the way i got taught was it good boys deserve food always and then you can see that what happens is we get that middle c that bridges it crosses over and we're going to go over onto the next line so i'm just on the lines here good boys deserve food always i think it's easier to use the cycle of thirds because it's a never-ending mnemonic it just keeps on going around so we've got good band deserves fans and cash every good band deserves fans there we go so just taking care of all the lines there now let's just start on the spaces i remember this from music college and it was all cows eat grass that's one that i got taught for the bass clef but if you think about it and cash every good band deserves fans so and cash every good band right okay so we've got to take care of where that ledger line goes because that's a space actually in between there it's just huge space if you want to think about it we'll add this extra ledger line in the middle there and cash every good band deserves fans and cash every now you may know this as being every good boy deserves favor or face in the space which is a good one but what we've done is we've taken care of the spaces as well there so we've got the lines and what notes are on there so these i've just done letters for now but we would essentially swap those over to be notes we would use the dots and the stems and all that business to tell you that anything that falls on that line is going to be an f just likewise here if i put something there anything that falls on this space here is going to be a g so that takes care of the natural notes i'm just going to use a treble clef here just to keep things simple because we can borrow from this idea here and i'm going to talk to you about about accidentals yeah accidentals are what we call the sharps and the flats a sharp looks like a hashtag a flat looks like a squished b letter so we'll call that a flat and i'll just talk about these first so if you imagine that this is the g clef and that's the note there let's put a note there and that is telling us that that note is a g right brilliant that's nice and easy but what if we want to start including notes that aren't the natural notes the notes with sharps and flats because the key that we're in dictates that we need to use sharps or flats we can take this g here and we can amend this note by adding something before it so if i put a sharp before it it turns this into a g sharp so we take that sharp and it turns it into a g sharp so look that would be a g sharp hopefully that makes sense there guys so look let's move on let's do the flat if i do the flat one then you can see that this is a g but it's got a flat on it i should have put that flat right on there there we go this is a g flat now these aren't the only ones you're going to come across another accidental you may come across is when a sharp or a flat needs turning into a natural note because you've changed key or something interesting is going on melodically and what we get is this note here and this cancels out your sharp or your flat and this is called a natural let's put that there so that would be taking me back to a g but that is telling you that you go back to a g after you've played one of these notes here but we're not done we have some more to go at and what happens if i take this g here what I can also do is put this symbol in front of it this is an x if i put an x in front of it this means g double sharp so x put it there equals double sharp so essentially if we take a g and if you think about it and you count it up on your fretboard and you went g on the third fret of your thick e string and then you went up a half step to get to the g sharp and then another half step that would take you to the note a and this is interesting here guys because what ends up happening is is an enharmonic equivalent which basically means it's got two names for the same 
sound. We can do this again. Well, yes, you've guessed it. You can have a double flat as well. And that would look like this. G double flat. Well, if you think about it, that third fret on your thick E string is a G. If you flatten it once, you get an F sharp. If you're going to think of it as the enharmonic equivalent, it would be a G flat or an F sharp. But if we flatten it again, what happens is we get an F natural. So that is the enharmonic equivalent. So this is going to come up when you have more complicated key changes and modulations and some clever stuff going on when you want to reduce the amount of notation that you have on the ledger lines just so it's less confusing because you start adding all this stuff it becomes a lot harder to read. So these are the accidentals that you will come across on this notation and pitch thing. So this staff ledger lines then knowing how the clefts affect the pitch on those ledger lines and then what pitches they are and then how those pitches are going to affect the notes that are on these staves i'll just give you another example of this and how this works and i'm going to do this in the key of g major i'm just going to put this f sharp on here this is declaring here that every time you play an f and we can just look at that it's intersecting on that line there so that's related to that f there just like that note was there the sharp is related so this is telling us that we've got an f sharp in this bunch of notes because it's g major we're going to start on g i'm going to do a note on the g i'm going to go a b c d e f and then go back to g again let me write those underneath this so that you understand what they are a b c d e f g so we're going from g to g that is one octave we need this to maintain a structure for it to be a major scale and that major scale goes turn turn semitone turn 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 semitone or step step half step 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 half step you can think of it in that manner now i know i'm just going to apply this to it we've got to take this sharp that is here and we've got to just scoot it over onto the corresponding f there because this note here becomes an f sharp and if you work this out you'll see that from g to a is a full step a to b is a step B to C is a half step, which is why we've got this little angle bracket here. C to D is a step. D to E is a step. And E to F sharp is a step. Because if it wasn't an F sharp, it would be a half step. And that would mess up our whole major scale structure. This is why we do this. Because remember, we're in major. G major. And this is how these accidentals affect the notes that we have on the stave. So we have the natural notes, but we have these modifiers. That's what they are, really. These are modifiers. So this is declaring them there. And then we have these modifiers. Let's just look at something else. Let's look at another key. I'm going to look at the key of B flat major. Now, if we look at the key of B flat major, let me put that treble clef in there as well. It's got two flat. And this is telling you that every time you hit a B, it's going to be turned into a B flat. And this is telling you every time it's an E, it's going to be classed as an E flat. And look, you can correlate that information. This is on the line. There's the B there. You can see it's on the line and that matches this one here. And then this is on an E. This is in a space. So you can see that this is this one here. So they correspond to each other. So this is the modifying it on that pitch axis as well. So if we go from here, all we need to do with this one now is we need to come from a B. I'm going to do this from underneath the middle C. So this is a B. We pull this in here and this is a C. Hopefully, look, this, is this an insight for you? Look, there's the B, there's the C. We're moving up. Here's the D, here's the E, here's the F, here's the G, here's the A. And then we're back to the B again. So we've gone B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Hopefully that makes sense there, guys. And because this is major, we need to maintain that structure. And we need to go turn, turn, semitone, turn, 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 semitone. Or you could think of that as step, step, half step, 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 half step, like we did before here, because that's what the major scale structure is. We've got to keep it that same scale structure because otherwise we are not got major anymore. It is something else completely. Now, what we have to do is we could be really clever and just like smarty pants and just say, well, that's a B flat. So what we need to do is just modify the B flats and change them. And then this is an E flat and we just change that one there but we can also add those here on the stave to those notes just so that it's absolutely crystal clear that those are flattened notes as well and hopefully you can see that if you went from a b flat which would be the first fret on your a string up to the c on the third fret then that would give you a full step 
it will give you a full turn distance, yes? And then going from a C to a D, that's a turn. Going from a D to an E flat is a semi-turn. Yes, that's banging. We've got that one. E flat to an F, that is a whole step or a turn. F to G is a whole step or a turn. G to A is a whole step or a turn. And look at how this B flat pulls this note back. A to B would be a whole step, wouldn't it? But if we've got this half step that we've got to do, then it moves it back. And this is why it's called flattening, because flats go this way and sharps go this way. Now, guitar operates on the treble clef, but there are some things that are anomalies that we have to get used to with operating on this treble clef. If you remember, this is your low E string in standard tuning. So this would be an E note. And as you can see, what's happened is we have the regular staff here, but we also have these additional ledger lines that have come off that staff to get to this here. Now, what I want to do is I just want to quickly show you where this actually comes from. And how I'm going to do that is I'm going to jump into the grand staff. So the grand staff is from the piano, essentially. We're not learning piano, but it doesn't harm to know a few bits from piano. So if we take this here, you can see that what happens is we get this note here. This is the E, like I say, and we've got three lines. Well, this top line here, let me just do a little arrow to this one. That is the C note, and that's the middle C. So if I put the middle C in here, so we've got the treble clef and the bass clef, and this is the C note that lives inside there. So if I just bold that, I'm going to make that really bold so it's pretty obvious what's going on. The next note below that would be an A, right? So we get an A there because that's a part of our mnemonic. We could go good band deserves fans and so we got an A there. And then if you remember what happened was we got these two dots here which tell us that this ledger line here is an F and you can see it spells fans and cash and if you think about it what note comes before F just count up your alphabet A B C D E F so we're going to get an E there this describes how we get to this extra bit let me just take all of that there there's the C line there's the A line there's the F line and that's where that E lives there so that's how we get those extra ledger lines going into the bass clef. This is the potty thing with guitar is, even though we transcribe it like that, remember we're still in the bass clef here, this note actually sounds down here. This is an E down in the bass clef. I just put that there just to make sure that you really understand it. So it sounds here, that's where the sound is, but what happens is we write it like this, but in reality, it actually lives here, okay? Just be careful with that. It sounds down here, it's written here, but it actually lives down there if you were thinking about it where it lived in the bass clef. The whole idea is just to space save, really. This is why we only use the treble clef when we play guitar. So just switching over to some manuscript and tab paper so I can show you what it looks like in standard notation and also how to understand it in tab as well. I want to show you the anomaly that is the fretboard and standard notation because when you play one note on a piano it can only ever be that note middle c will only sound like middle c but on guitar because we've got six strings we can play middle c in a couple of different places and it will sound different and this is the beautiful thing about the guitar because it has these different timbres that we can access so we've got this e here this is the lowest sounding e that we have and that would be open e string if you don't know your tab it goes eddie eight dynamite goodbye eddie Eddie, it, dynamite, good, by Eddie. So we've got another mnemonic to help us with that one. So that would be the open E string. Now, here's the thing that happens with these notes. As we go up into another octave, this note here is in a space. If there was a ledger line beneath it, then you would see where that space exists. Now, a thing happens when we switch over from one octave to the next, it goes from space to a line. So we go from a line and then the same thing applies. It goes from a line to a space when we go up. Now we have an E here. What we can do is we can think about this. If we look at it from the perspective of the E string, then this could be the notation for playing an E on the 12th fret of that E string. 
I'm just showing you a few of the different places that we can do this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put this E here again and just to show you that actually this is going to be the same note. It's going to be written in two different places. This is really useful if you're reading the music and you think to yourself, well, I can't stretch to that note. So can I find it closer? Well, you might be able to if you know where to find it on other strings. So this is an E note, but what we're going to do is we're going to put it on the second fret of the D string because you can see here Eddie a dynamite D string second fret and that would be exactly the same note as it is written there so let's do that again I'm going to show you the next octave up and this one as you can see is on a line and the next one is going to be well guess what it's going to be in a space so you can see it's going space line space now this is another e and all we're doing is just looking at these e notes here well the most logical version would be to look at it as being the open e on the thin e string and we could do that there's a lot of variety with this one here guys so this could be the e here and we could have this on the fifth fret of the b string as well and this would be exactly the same note but the thing is it's the timbre that changes we could even put this on the ninth fret of the g string and that would be exactly the same note so this is why reading standard notation can be tricky but the thing is it's all about the note choices that you want to make the timbre that you think is important to express the sound that you want under your fingers so i could take this onto other strings that could be the 14th fret on the d string it could be the 19th fret of the a string as well and that note would still be the same thing however you're starting to get a little bit silly you have to pick your battles now when it comes to where these notes are because some of the notes that are going to be around these are going to dictate where it is that you are playing on the fretboard it might not necessarily be down in this region but just to know that you can play these notes if you play this open here on your thin e string five on your b string nine on your g string then we go here onto the 14th fret of the d string and then we go to the 19th fret guess what if you've got a 24 fret guitar then that's what's going to happen you can play that same note there that's exactly how that would look and that makes sense if you think about it look there's that zero there's the 12 and then we get another octave up so that's one octave and that's up to another octave there so we've only just gone up two octaves this so i just want you to be aware that the notes as they are notated can be found in lots of different positions on the neck so let's take this note the open string are there on the e string so that's going to be e there now what we want to do is if this is the open e string here to go up an octave if you think about it logically that would be the 12th fret on the thin E string. So we take that up. Then what we need to do is we need to take this note up as well because we need to go up it in pitch. Now the way we could do it is we can add one, two, three ledger lines. And if we think about it, if we go like this, every good band deserves fans and cash every. You see what happens is this note goes here on the line. And remember what I said, this is on the line. This is in the space this is on the line so you can use that to just clarify that you are hitting the right note there so that would give you that note there but <laughs> this is guitar again remember what i said about the notes where they sound and where they are written once you get your head around it then you'll understand why these things crop up what we can also do is we could go back to this version here and we could play that e like this and that, what we do to denote that is we would put this little symbol up there, 8VA, which means it's played an octave above. It's played an octave above, even though it's written an octave below. So that would be the same thing. Confusing? Well, this is guitar notation, but if you know this, then you are one step ahead. We don't want to be going too far off into the treble clef extra ledger lines because if we're already going into the base ledger lines we're extending out and we're extending up then we're going to run out of space so let's look at this here again let's take this note here this would make sense then if we were going to go up another octave again we go up to the 24th fret which is the last fret on your guitar thank goodness so this is the last note that you can get to well what we would then do is we would apply this 8VA here we're going to extend these out here I'm going to put that E note here because look it goes and cash every 
ace. I always used to think that music college, I just think that adding these is ace. If I want that to sound at the 24th fret now, I have to amend that and I have to put this 8VA or 8VE sometimes it's written. And that tells you that that is my highest pitch. So really, when we're looking at extending the ledger lines, what we've got is we've got three ledger lines that we start at here and that goes all the way up to extending it to this E up here with the 8VA on it there. And that's the whole range and compass of the pitch on the guitar. But we need to be able to use these different positions to find these notes. Remember what this was about, all this business here. This was about finding the tombra because you'll find that that E is pingy and this one is woolly and you will get different colors out of those notes as you switch through these here. Hey up guys, if you'd like to support my work on YouTube, then please consider purchasing a copy of my book. The book is a compilation of PDFs from all the aha and light bulb moment lessons that you can find here on my YouTube channel, but all in one convenient place. It's available in three formats, a spiral bound copy, a paperback, but if you prefer an ebook for instant download, then you can grab that by clicking the link in this video or going to rickysguitar.com forward slash store to grab your copy.